Divine Truth Assistance Group Group Assistance Sessions Putting Principles of Divine Truth into Action This recording is from the Developing My Loving Self Group and is part of an Education in Love series. In the creation of my Real Self Question and Answer presentation, Jesus answers questions from the audience about the material covered in the previous presentation, The Creation of My Real Self. Recorded on the 27th of May, 2016, in New Seville, Queensland, Australia. We come to the Q&A of the creation of my real self. Let's get started. Okay, um, if we start with Kel at the back, come down to Karen and across to Deidre on this side. Thanks. Kel. Uh, whilst I'm unaware that I'm unaware, what is the law that brings us together? Um, there are a huge number of laws that bring your so you and your soulmate together. Uh, for example, the law of desire does it. The law of attraction does it. When you engage the laws of divine love, that does it. There's, yeah, there's so many laws. When you engage forgiveness and repentance of the, anything to do with the opposite gender, if your soulmate is of the opposite gender, that does it. So there's a whole heap of different laws that uh, engage it. But one of the biggest things that has a, a great effect is the law of desire. You actually it, finding out what your true soul-based passions are and doing them. That does it. So a personal, my own personal desires of my individualised part of the soul. Yeah, so we're not talking about your addiction desires, no. are we? Because they're not desires, they're just addictions. We're not talking about what your pain dictates you're allowed to desire. No. But we're talking about what in your heart you really do desire. And that require, that's a process of self-discovery, is it not? Yes. But once you discover that and you engage it with action, that certainly attracts your soulmate. Uh -huh, so Soulmates can't help themselves about that. Uh -huh. <laughs> because I was wondering, can you have a des you, do, at that point you don't have a desire for the other half of you, do you? You have to develop it, don't, do you? Well, no, you also need to develop a desire for your other half. Yeah. Which means releasing all of yep. your pain yeah. about the other half. Yeah. But you can develop a desire for the other half, certainly you can. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Yep. Majority of you don't, though, do you? I, I feel that in my childhood I wanted a partner, but it was all out of <laughs> neediness and security yeah. and, yeah. Yeah, a lot of it's out of that. <laughs> Although a lot of the ch children have much pu purer desires when it comes to these kind of things. But by the yeah. time we're adults, we're so fully engaged in our addictions normally mm -hmm. that it's very, very hard for us even to recognise what a real desire is, let alone act upon it. And also most of us have a deep desire for control and that's the opposite of a soulmate relationship. Soulmate relationship is uncontrolled. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's when you can't help yourself. <laughs> but not can't help yourself in a in an addiction. Yeah. It's when you can't help yourself acting in a loving in a loving in harmony with love. You know. Sure. Thank you. Mm. Yeah. We, Deidre is next. So. Um, I just wanted to just get a little bit more clarity on what you said about the the global terror that I'm refusing to feel mm -hmm. is about me just being terrified of being my real self. Yep. So, for example, if one of my real passions, so it's all about my passions, my desires, my intentions, that's, is that what you mean by the real self? Yeah, but I also mean being your real self no matter what anybody projects at you, no matter how people treat you. See, we're terrified of the, of the world around us. We, we were taught to be terrified by our parents because they are terrified as well. They're terrified of being who they really are. Most, most of us are terrified of being who we really are. We're not truthful. We're not honest. We're not open. These are all things that are all part of our real self, being honest, truthful, open, transparent about our real passions and our real desires and displaying our real personality and our real nature. And all of these things <coughs> are essential parts of the discovery of ourselves, and yet we don't let any of those things be. Mm. And why? 
It's because we believe the facade is the way we have to interface with the world. And that's driven by the fact that if we interface with the world from our real self, most of us would have to experience quite extreme amounts of terror first before we can do that. Yep. I just want a clarification, thanks. Yep. Karen? If I have no desire for my soulmate, mm -hmm. I'm sorry if this is a bit basic, but then I'm in denial and does that mean I have to go through the anger at the opposite or whichever sex my soulmate is in order to um, develop a desire? Well, um, it's interesting, Karen, because most of our denial of our soulmate is born out of the false beliefs that come from our pain. So, so before you can really open up to your soulmate, you need to open up to your false beliefs and the pain associated with those false beliefs regarding, you know, relationships in particular, whether that be with your soulmate, the gender of your soulmate or not. Even your relationship with the same gender has a huge impact on your soulmate. For example, what I see many of you ladies doing is you don't act unless you have the approval of other women. Right? So that, that has a huge impact on you joining with your soulmate because most women feel angry with men. And a lot of women in the Western world at this stage have no real reasons to be that angry with men in comparison to the previous generations of women. Right? So you get a lot of spirit influence also to be angry with men. But that anger with men uh, causes you to not open your heart to men. And that, of course, is a part of the pain. Right? And that's going to, of course, cause you to feel like, I don't want a soulmate, I don't want a guy. You know? You know, and that may also cause you can see uh, feelings of even um, attraction to the same sex, couldn't it? Mm. Um, those kind of feelings can easily be generated by the fact that you just don't want anything to do with the opposite sex. So there's a whole heap of things that need to be addressed, but it's all it's the pain and false beliefs that dictate most of uh, our feelings about the other half of ourselves. Right. And, and the facade has the desire to control that. Mm. So when you, have, when you say you have no desire to meet your soulmate, that's not even true. God created you with a desire to meet your soulmate. So, so here's your soul, in your case, right? So, so God created you with a desire to, to, be, to meet it, and you've detuned from this desire. Now, that detunement caused, is caused by society sin, parent sin, and your own sin. Does that make sense? Yep. So it's not just, uh, and it's not just your own sin, it's also things like society sin and parent sin, like... Like, how many times have I heard people say, there's plenty of fish in the sea? Mm. Why do we say that? Because we want to believe that it's our choice and there's plenty of fish in the sea. <laughs> <clears throat> we want to believe that there's not just one person, there's hundreds of opportunities or thousands of opportunities to enter a relationship. We want to believe that. So, so we ignore the fact there is such a thing as a other half of ourselves even though we're connected to them, we're just not aware of the connection and we don't want to be aware because many of us are freaked out by the concept that how are we ever going to find them? We are. And we want to, we're desperate because we're up here with our addictions, we're desperate for a relationship. And so what do we do? We either tell ourselves that every woman we meet is our soulmate or man we meet is our soulmate or we tell ourselves there's plenty of fish in the sea and you know, I can choose to have a relationship with her and, and it's going to be good and we'll last forever and all that stuff. And, oh, you're my soulmate. We're going to be together forever, that kind of thing, you know. Or whoever you're married, that's who you're going to be with forever or whatever. And there's huge amounts of beliefs like that on this planet that have gone on for millennia. It's no wonder we're pretty damaged when it comes to recognising the other half of ourselves. The key is to allow ourselves to go through the pain and recognise it. Even if, if I don't even have a desire to be with the other half of myself, then it's because the desire has been suppressed and the main way desire gets suppressed is through fear. So there's got to be fears that are controlling this desire that God created to be a natural desire. Does that make sense? Yep. Thank you. 
And if we go to Di and then to Eva. Thanks. Um, I've got some, I don't know, a couple of questions about personality, but your first mm-hmm. answer might negate the second. Yep. Um, I guess what is personality and how can we recognise our real one when we're so damaged, you know, like, well, particularly, yeah, like that, I won't ask that, yeah, regarding myself in that sense. Well, I think all of you know what personality is. I think the dictionary definition of personality is fairly accurate. Um, And that's, you know, each of you have a unique personality. But unfortunately, as you do say, the pain and the facade have, have caused your personality to conform to the world's definition of what is good. And, and that's caused a change to you where you've modified the expression of your personality to conform to the world's requirements. So um, I feel that all of you, um, and particularly in your childhoods, all of you were fairly aware of your own nature or becoming aware of your own nature. But what happened was that you, are, your nature got suppressed, firstly, by your parents. They taught you when your nature was out of harmony with their viewpoint of what is right. And then once that happened, you then engaged the teaching of yourself to modify your nature because there were certain parts of your nature that you were taught to be ashamed of and there were certain parts of your nature you were taught to avoid there were certain parts of your nature that you taught were wrong and you were punished for certain parts of your nature, sometimes violently. And as a result of that, that caused a detunement from engaging your true nature and, and, and it ended up then you suppressing that nature or modifying it to suit the world. So I meet some people, for example, and they're extrovert, but, I, but actually their real nature is not extrovert. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And... And I've modified their nature to become extrovert in order to get certain addictions met and certain approvals, and that's what they've done. And, you know, but, but with personality, um, there are very, very many factors involving personality, and that is your general feelings about, like, thousands of things add up to your real personality and your real nature. The key is for you to discover it, firstly for yourself, and then express it to the world. And, you know, we're going to talk a bit about that tomorrow, about the expression of your nature to the world as a part of a love of self, an act of love of self. Mm. Thank you, because I feel like tomorrow you'll answer the second part, which is about how can we use our personality to help us grow and develop. Yeah, it's a very important part of your growth, actually, using your personality, learning to be who you really feel you are. But you can see that it's going to require removal of quite a lot of this, isn't it? Because, it's, it, because it is, some, right at the beginning, it's very, very hard to know what you, who you really are. Although usually, for most people, bits of their true nature poke through at different times, sometimes when they're happy and they're not self-conscious. Um, that's when usually bits of your true nature poke the head out. Um, Other times when you're um, by yourself and if you're a spirit looking at the person when they're by themselves, you can sometimes see their true nature, you know, starting to come out. But when as soon as they're with people, they modify that because of the facade being required for the interaction with people. So, you know, we, we have a lot of habits that do need to be removed if we're going to truly express our true nature and character as God designed it to be. And, and even just discovering it, you'll spend the rest of your existence discovering more about yourself. It's not something you'll know. You won't know everything about yourself even after 100 years of doing it, or 1,000 years of doing it, in fact. You, you'll discover more things about yourself as you, as you engage more and more of yourself and you, and you receive more and more of God's love. So it's a growth process coming to understand your true nature. Yeah. Thank you. And mm. um, so if we're over here to Joanne and Liam on this side, thanks. Um, if we're meant to use our soul to fix or to heal our physical body, mm-hmm. 
then why did God put like herbs that help us to heal our physical body on earth? Um, well, you, you have a think about the answer to that question. It's a pretty easy answer, I think. One, one thing I thought is, is that just part of the lower laws that if we don't do the soul thing, then God in his love and goodness has, okay. Yeah, there's one. Yeah, that's what I suspected. I can't think yeah. of any other. Is it going to have a permanent effect? No. Why? No, it doesn't um, because it's not the real thing. Well, it's not in harmony with the soul's, what, what is in the soul. In the spirit world, like when you read the Robert James Lee's books, you'll see that the reason why the healing operates upon the physical, the spirit body, the physical spirit body, is because their soul is also engaged in, in already having made those particular changes. Mm -hmm. So actually, uh, the, the physical things were provided to speed up. See, so if the soul is in a certain condition, the physical substances which were supplied by God to speed up the bodies to catch up to the soul's condition. No. But you can't actually change the soul, the, the spirit body or the physical body beyond the soul's condition. Okay. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. It's, so, only, it's only a catch up process. So, in a sense, it's, you know, to, to maintain our physical body a little longer to give us more chance to to connect with our, to use our soul. Yes, but also to help us alleviate some of the pain in our physical body and our spirit body that comes from, so once we see the pain, quite often we will start to acknowledge its cause, which is emotional in its nature, and then God provides us mechanisms, including physical things, to help, to help alleviate some of that pain while we're addressing the emotion. Okay, yep, yeah. Yep, but we have to address that. the emotion if the change is going to be permanent. Yep, yep. I understand that better now. Thank you. Yep. Uh, where were we? Lehman? Yep. Uh, just getting back to the personality question. Yes. From a soul's point of view, is there actually anything um, like the label of introvert and extrovert? It's only no. just our, our um, damaged behaviour, our yes. painful self. Yes, you know how there's been many books written nowadays on the subject of personality and nature and many of them are an attempt to classify people into four or eight groups of different types of people and none of these type of classifications actually apply to your soul and uh, as uh, most of them apply to injuries, in fact, that you've obtained through, the, through your life. And the reality is that very few books that have ever been written on the, on the planet about personality and nature are actually about personality and nature. They're really about emotional injuries and facade and how those emotional injuries and facade have played out in a person's choices and the use of their will. Okay. Mm. So it's not like you would have <laughs> half the soul could be introverted and half could be extroverted. Then when they join, they balance themselves out. No, I think. no. All right. No. Okay, in fact, a lot of the so-called introvert and extrovert discussion is all about, you can see from an introvert perspective, you see a, a shyness is all about fear really, isn't it? Different fears being expressed. And the extrovert is about the way the soul has related to those fears. So, so quite often what we do is we put on a facade around those fears so we make out we don't have them and that's what often creates the extrovert. Often they have exactly the same emotions as the introvert, but it's just a different way of expressing or or working with those emotions in day to day practice. Yeah, none of that really relates to personality or nature. Yeah, uh, Glennis um, and Eva. Um, AJ, I'm just um, a little bit more interested in how the facade tends to work against the real self. Right. Like, um, I'm just... Yeah. Well, the facade is all about lies, isn't it? It's all about portraying the lie. What, the reason for the facade was two, two primary reasons. One is to deny your pain. The second reason is to deny the terror. So desensitise the pain, deny the terror. That's the main result. Now... Now, the pain believes itself to be your real self, right? So the, what the facade is doing is supporting the pain in its belief, right? Now, that, of course, is removing you from who you really are, an awareness of who you really are, 
right? Now, now we do it for lots of different reasons, lots of different reasons, but a lot of them relate to what we want others to perceive us to be, don't they? So our facade is about what we want ourselves to look like to the world, what we want ourselves to perceive ourselves to be, and what we want others to perceive us to be. That's what our facade is, usually around those three things. And, and, and that none of those things are what God created us to be. None of those things. So, of course, our facade is really the enemy of our real self. And, in fact, our facade, if we go back into our childhood, many times we, our real self was suppressed and controlled and manipulated by our family, by our family of origin. So we were taught that being your real self is a bad thing. And many of you are deeply ashamed of your real self and you don't even really know why. But, but one of the reasons why is because you were punished for being your real self at different times in your childhood. So is that why um, potentially the facade is terrified of the real self because of those memories? Yes, the facade is terrified of not so much of the real self but the facade is terrified of if you are your real self, what will happen to you? So, so a lot of it's about the threat of attack, the threat of violence, the threat of ridicule, the threat of you know all these different threats that we that we unfortunately um, endured in our childhood. They were all real, you know. They were all real threats to our to our very existence in many cases. And so, what we learned is being your real self is a bad thing. The real self's bad. Being your real self is a bad thing. You've got to be the facade. That's the way you survive. And so the f f facade naturally is terrified about you being your real self. And there's your global terror. It's naturally terrified because of a whole series of events that occurred in your childhood and way before your childhood and in your parents' childhood and so forth that are all passed down. It's really sad, huh? The very thing that God created you to be you're struggling to not be. You yourself are struggling to not be because you were taught to not be that and you were taught that if you were that, you were going to be harmed or in many cases brutalised as a child, uh, abused as a child and so you're taught to not be that. So you, you decided to not be that, to not discover that, not be that. So for most of you, your real self is almost completely undeveloped. Like it's like, it's like it's a little tiny speck yet to be, yet to be even a, a acknowledged or developed. Because even acknowledging it, you're terrified of. As soon as you acknowledge it and you start developing it, you're going to find a lot of changes in your life happen very rapidly. Your friends will change very rapidly because people will, you'll stop feeding addictions and everything else. And then what's the point, point of being friends? That was the only point. Being a friend was feeding that addiction and feeding this addiction, so you stop being friends and, and you start reacting from your real self. People go, oh, I don't like you anymore. And that's what you're afraid of, one of the things you're afraid of, being your real self and nobody liking you. Hmm. Um, I've got another question, but it's... Sure. Um, I'm just wondering um, where like the aborted babies go like they're at cons well, they yeah, that's way they off to way off topic, Gladys. Okay, yeah. yeah. So let's let's move okay, on with that. Right. One. Yep. Yeah. Who where are we up to? Eva, sorry. And then Ben down on this side. Yes, um, <clears throat> I have a question about uh, desire for a connection with God. Yeah. And that um, uh, the creation of the little soul and the conception and the birth all awareness of God through our parents' emotions is kind of gone. Mm -hmm. So we think our parents are like our God. They are, yeah, that's how so, we see them. So my question was, we're actually having this gift of a, a kind of a longing for a connection with a God built into the soul, that's the question. Um, no, the soul hasn't been created with a longing for God. The soul has been created with a potential to develop a longing for God. And there's a big difference between what the soul has been created with and what the soul has been created with as its potential 
So, so what we need to do, and we will, we will look at some of this in the next talk, about the difference between potential and reality. So you could think of potential as a framework of possibilities. So the, so the soul certainly was created with the possibility of developing a longing for God, but not with an automatic longing for God. And in fact, if God had placed within the soul an automatic longing for God, then God himself would have been manipulating your will before you began. So you can see logically that God wouldn't do that. However, God has placed within the soul, uh, an, uh, remember this whole soul, this is the whole soul. So, so from, from a conceptual perspective, there is a longing for each half to have the other half. And you see that acting out all the time, don't you? Like the whole reason why most people get married is because of that. And the whole reason why we get together is because of that. There's this longing for that connection just being expressed in a lot of damaged ways, but, but it's there. And, and that's, an, that's because we're actually one soul still like developing some level of awareness of the other half of itself. So, so you could say that... God, the longing for the two halves to be joined is, is, from God's perspective, not even a reality because God created them joined. <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? They, they, they are joined. It's just, it's just what's happened in a lot of this and also our own will, the development of ourselves, that has caused us to not be aware of the join. Uh, and that's what causes the, uh, the concept of separation. But the reality, the reality is from God's perspective, God, God didn't create the two halves of the soul with a longing for each other. God created them joined. <laughs> you know, so, so naturally they are, you know, from God's perspective, already joined. That's one soul. That's called one person, one soul from God's perspective. Does that make sense? So mm -hmm. you see, the word soulmate doesn't really exist in God's vocabulary do you understand that? It's only a, a, a mechanism by which uh, spirits, that spirits invented in order to understand the concept of the other half of oneself. But from, in God's vocabulary, it doesn't exist. Yeah, and I, I suddenly uh, I feel that that gift is into our soul and we all look for someone to join with actually yes. so it's very obvious that we actually have that gift correct um, uh, my question if i just go a little bit back to it was like why do we then look upon our parents as god is that what they want us to do yes they do in fact that's the whole point of a lot of their sin is to force the child into believing that the parent is the ruler of the child's life Many of you still believe that actually about your own children, that you are their parent and you deserve their respect and you deserve their love and all these kind of feelings that many parents have. Right? They are all out of harmony with love. But, but they cause the child to start to see you as God rather than seeing God as God and you as an older brother or an older sister. Right? And many of you are deeply confronted as parents about the concept of being an older brother or an older sister because it means you have no control over your children. It means that they, can't, they don't have to listen to you. From God's perspective, they don't have to listen to you, they don't have to honour you, don't have to do anything with you. And in fact, in your future, you may not see them for thousands of years. Thanks. Mm -hmm. If we go, uh, oh, we were down at Ben. So we go to Ben and then Kelly at this one and then Robert. So Ben first. Uh, just two parts. I don't know if the second part's appropriate. Yep. But um, when you're hard on yourself, is there a distinction? Is it your real self hard on its facade or are you attacking yourself because your real self knows you, that this is wrong? Or have you just been taught and that's that? Sort yeah, of you've been taught. Um, from God's perspective, no matter what you do, there's no point in being hard on your real self. There is a point to changing what you've done, you know, removing your sin and doing something more lovingly. But, but there's no point in attacking your real self. And the interesting thing from a soul perspective is that when you attack your real self, you are distancing yourself from the other half of yourself as well. 
automatically because you're really saying that like I'm not worthy or I'm not whatever, whatever it is that you're attacking yourself about and that particular statement you're making towards yourself which is an emotion or projection you've got going towards yourself is also naturally going towards the other half of yourself. So you're actually distancing yourself from the other half of yourself. Yeah. yeah. Learned behaviour. Yeah, it's a learned behaviour and parents love it because it's a way of gaining control of their children to attack themselves. See, the way you've learnt to manage violence in your childhood and particularly emotional violence is that if you attack yourself, then the people around you won't attack you because they'll see that you're sorry for what you know, they think you should be sorry about. And so, so you, know, you attack yourself as a, as a mechanism to, to avoid their attack of you. And in, in relation to that hard thing, this is what I'm not sure, but um, that phrase, um, nothing's come easy, e everything in my life has been very difficult and felt very hard. Yeah. Is that um, from all those causes or is that you making it, creating that because of you being hard on yourself? Well, there's two main reasons. One is firstly, there's a lot of pain and terror that's been suppressed. That has it, God now, God's universe is now uh, operating in such a way it, to attract you back to that pain and terror, right? So in other words, the law of attraction is operating in such a manner to help you expose that pain and terror, which then you take a stronger effort to get away from. And in the stronger effort you make, you sin more. And it's harder. And you cause more pain and therefore it's more difficult. And, and yes, so, so all the difficulties we experience in life are the result of our own choices to avoid the pain and the terror and then, and then the subsequent results of that are further pain and suffering, more extreme pain and suffering and a more and more difficult life. So you're unconsciously being hard on yourself through that story of your life sort yes, of thing. Yes, you are. Actually, one of the things that are very important to realise is that, is that a person who loves themselves will love to feel their pain. Because I had that false belief that pain is good and that makes you stronger and better and you need that in your future. Yeah, well, that's one of these uh, teachings that have come along to help a person avoid the fact they're in so much pain and to feel bad about it. So what, what they try to do is they try to help you distance yourself from your pain by telling yourself that pain is good and all the pain you experience is good. Of course, from God's perspective, God doesn't want your soul to experience pain at all. Now, God created a universe where you don't have to feel pain at all. If you did everything in harmony with love and truth and the people around you did everything in harmony with love and truth, you would never experience pain again. So, so God's made a universe to, to help, help you have no pain at all and yet we engage the cycle of pain, which is all about sin, and then we tell us that it's good. And it just gets harder and harder. <laughs> We're nutters, harder, eh? Yeah. Aren't we? We're just totally bonkers yes. telling ourselves that pain is good so that we can avoid the fact that we're breaking some laws that would actually help us have no pain at all. Yeah, that's nasty, that bit. Yeah. <laughs> what? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Kelly? And um, so when God was designing us, I don't want to sound like I'm justifying it, but wasn't it in going to be inevitable when we were unaware of ourselves that we were going to sin? No, I don't think so. No? No. Okay. It's not inevitable. It's the use of a will. It's, it requires the use of will to sin. So it's not inevitable. Okay. I feel that God knew that someone would choose to do it, certainly, mm. and therefore God created laws to redeem us from that choice. But uh, it certainly isn't it inevitable. Like if you live in the, in the celestial spirit world, it's inevitable that everyone will be loving. <laughs> it's wonderful. Did, did they all have sin first though? Yeah, the majority of people, of course, by, yeah. you know, everyone in the spirit world has sinned at some point. But that was, everyone also comes to see that it was their choice. Mm. They could have chose not to. It ju I, I suppose there's a feeling that whilst we didn't have a relationship with God automatically, it wasn't a given when we were born. No, it was a, the relationship with God was actually offered as a potential to the first human couple. 
Right. So which they chose to not to not take. But but at some point they were going. Uh, humans were going to choose that because that was in, in the potential. In, there was mm. a possibility of them choosing it. At some point they will. Okay. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. At some point, you, if you give a person free will or a group of people free will, at some point one of them is going to choose to exercise their free will out of harmony of love. Yes, so it's at the some point. Yeah, it just happened to be in our point. earth, it just happened to be right at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good, thank you. Mm. Robert, thanks. I suppose in some ways we've just got it over and done with straight away. <laughs> I'm not sure this isn't a silly question. Um, is my facade and my soulmate's facade now actually a part of my soul as it currently exists? Yes. Like it's not like a thing sticking out the side you can cut off or something. You know, it's like <laughs> no, it's a part of your soul. It's emotions that exist, yeah. and all emotions that exist exist within the soul. And so, yes, it's a part of your soul. It's the, it's the mud, if you like, that's been thrown at your soul, or the or mm. the, the dirtiness that's been imbibed through mm. the action of sin. And that, that certainly has tainted the soul itself and therefore causing the emotion. It causes a whole group of emotions which create separation between the two halves. Yep. It's a lack of awareness, in other words, between the two halves. Yep. yep. So even if I clear all of my half, I'm still going to feel pain coming from the other half? No. 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 Because once you've cleared your half, you have no pain that's personal to experience. So you'll recognise and feel the other half's pain, but you won't feel it as, a, as your pain. It, okay. it's, um, because it can't flow through you. It has to flow through them in order to be released. Uh, okay. But I and that's because of, again, the lack of awareness. If it got created in a lack of awareness, then it also needs to be experienced in the lack of awareness. That makes sense? So if, if the whole soul takes an action that the whole soul is aware of, then it's the whole soul that bears the consequence of that action. But if a half of the soul takes, a, takes an action, where the other half isn't aware of its, of its happening and this half's not aware of it happening for the other half, then it's the half of the soul that's going to have to take the awareness of its actions. Does that make sense? Yep. It's going yep. to be attributed to the, uh, the awareness. Is, the lack of awareness caused the separation and therefore the emotion can't flow between the two halves. Now, if you're a reincarnated soul, it's a little different to that. But but do we go into that? Or <laughs> like, there's only 14 of those, so yeah. you know, we really don't need to cover much about that. But the reality is, I've had to process emotions of memories. Emotion, I've processed mm. emotional memories of Marys from from our life. Yeah. Because in a reincarnated soul, you are a complete soul, fully aware of what's going on. So naturally, the emotions do flow as a part of the awareness. So I have actually processed emotion. <laughs> That Mary, that were related, was related to Mary's life. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Mm, it was very confusing when I first did it, but <laughs> nowadays, now because I, you know, it was like a, a woman being raped, and I'm processing the emotion of it, so it's a bit bit hard. So, um, yeah. So so very very difficult. But that's that's only fourteen. That's for corny, you know. Have to have those conversations with him. <laughs> you don't have to worry about that. Uh, if we go to Louise on this side, and if we go to to Yvonne on this side, thanks, Louise. I'm sorry. I know you've explained this somewhere before, but so why are we suffering from Amon and a man's decision to sin? I know you've explained it. I'm sorry. Well, I think I've explained it plenty of times, actually. But uh, but they use their will to walk away from God. And the problem with using your will to walk away from God is it creates a state in the next generation of people where they no longer have a will to want God. So this is what you're battling with now. Many of you don't have a will to want God yet. And you're battling with that, and, and, and that needs to now be developed. So their will needed to be developed. Now, it took nearly 140-something thousand years on this planet before a person, myself, developed that will. So why did God make it like that, that we have this experience the sins of our fathers? Well, God made it for many reasons that are all very logical and make a lot of sense. 
And, and I've also covered the answer to that in the previous assistance group. And it was a question by Amber, if you want to remember. Amber um, asked a couple yeah. of questions. And if you go back on for those two yeah. questions uh, that she asked, you'll find that's where I provide the answer. Thanks. To that. I've got an emotional block. Yep, you have. And um, we were over at Yvonne. Yep. Um, one of the things that you said here is that the soul can only become unified if both halves accept the complete expression of self. What, what does that mean? Well, to become unified, both halves need to accept the complete expression of who they are They're as a as a whole, right? That that's the way you become unified. So so now I'm starting to talk about stuff that's in the thirty six the yeah. transition between the thirty six and the thirty fifth spheres. No wonder it didn't make any sense to me. And <laughs> and it, and a lot of it's not going to make any sense at all to you until you you can grasp the soul itself and actually connect to it and so forth but but the reality is the unified what i've been calling for you the unified condition which is the soul union state is actually already in everyone but there's no awareness of it you follow me there's no self-awareness of it there's a separation due to injuries but also due to the lack of awareness and, and what you need to do is go through a whole heap of spirits. Now, after you become a one with God, you start going through a whole heap of experiences where you become more and more aware of the, you could call it the, the desire or the actualization of yourself as an individual. And that the more and more aware of yourself as an individual you become, of course, the more... And, and when I talk about individual, I'm talking about this one soul as one individual... And the more aware you become, the more you act as that individual of the whole time. Now, it requires both halves do that in order to be completely aware of the union condition. Can't, it can't happen without the reception of God's love either. You can't actually do it without God's love. The reason why is the soul is incapable, has been created in such a way that it's incapable of entering a union condition Right. Remember, um, the best way to put it is like this. Here's our soul, and this is now quite some complex uh, ideas, but here's our soul in its, in its created state unaware of itself. You follow? Now, because it's unaware of itself, there's really a gap, isn't there, between the two halves because they're not aware of each other. Uh, the lack of awareness has caused this gap. But it's not just the lack of awareness that causes the gap. The reality is that God's love also needs to be experienced in order for this soul to completely join. So, so a soul in the sixth fear condition, which is perfected in natural love, the two of the two halves work together frequently and quite frequently, um, but they are still not joined because they have not received God's love in order to grow to the other parts of the stages that are required for the soul to have a full awareness of its, of its full condition. Do you follow me? So they basically live in a state of, of a gap still, even though they are together, they're physically together, but they live in a gap. Uh, with, there's a gap between the two halves. This unified condition as an, in an aware state requires the reception of God's love. Not only to, to the point of at one moment with God, but also it requires a number of other transitions. Every seventh sphere, there is another transition. Different, uh, there's different attributes, I suppose you could say, of God's nature that you, that you enter in each condition, and each condition allows you to become aware of what is uh, what needs to be done in order to remove the blockages for the union state. And, and, and by the way, this soul in this state really is like this, if you could draw, draw it in terms of, uh, in, some, in a little bit of scale. So it's like this. Does that make sense? And then when it's in a six fear state, it's really, in reference to that, it's really just like this. And that's as far as it can go without God's love. It can't do anything further. And then it's got to make a number of transitions in terms of its emotional and awareness and experience, its ability to be sensitive to ever larger groups of emotional conditions and, and to get to that stage. 
the final union condition. Do you follow? Yeah. So it's like when you see these souls in development uh, from the union state, it's like um, looking at a like when you first see the so souls of of the first incarnation, it's like a little speck. And when you see it like this, the six sphere state, it's like sort of not much bigger than the speck. It's, it's uh, you know probably a factor of ten bigger than that speck, you know, in terms of its condition. And that that's the natural condition, and the soul is unable to expand beyond that condition without God's love. So it can't union. It can't be aware of its union, uh, unified state in that condition ever because of the different problems that it has in that state. One of the biggest, it's still committing sin. The biggest sin, which is the rejection of God's love. So, so it's still committing sin, so it co it's still lack of awareness. It's the, it's, the, it's the reception of God's love that allows the soul to continually expand and therefore become more and more aware of its condition until eventually it unifies. Do you follow? And, and this state is like, you could think of it like, souls in, in the unified state look like, if you, if you can conceive, that's the size of a soul when it first comes to earth. The soul in the unified state looks like earth. <laughs> so, so do you see the difference? Like, it's hu huge changes of capacity and ability and power and so forth. Yeah. Um, when you talked about individualization, I think you said that um, the individualization process is not complete until both halves have incarnated. Uh, yes, is that that's right? true. Because um, it needs both halves to incarnate before both halves are in the process of. So that means the conception process has to occur for both halves. Uh, yes. Yes. Once that conception process occurs for both halves, the soul is now individualized. Does that does individualization is complete? Okay. Does individualization mean anything other than that's the word used to describe that state? That's all it means. Okay. Yeah. It's just a, and in fact, in your notes, you notice that I've said uh, at incarnation, awareness of my real self is completely undeveloped. So my nature and personality exist, but in a potential state of expression. My will exists, but in a potential state of expression. I am innocent. I am influenced by the will of others. So, and I have no awareness of the other half of myself, usually at this state, right? And so these are all parts of uh, being in the initial state. And, and, but the reality is uh, when I have, I, as soon as I arrive on the planet in conception, in the conceived state, I am now individualised and my heart and both halves have to go through that place to complete the individualization process. So you could say the individualization process begin of the complete soul begins when one half conceive is conceived, it's now joined to two bodies, and it ends when the other half is conceived and joins the two bodies. And the gap between those two particular events may be anything from a few months or no months at all, right the way through to a few years, five, 10, 15 years. That process is then complete. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Well, we're way over time, guys, and uh, and and the problem is, is that the problem with all this information is there's a whole heap of real good information that's coming afterwards, and the more we get stuck on on this, uh, the more we can't cover later. So, so what I'm going to try to do is uh, obviously you've got lots of questions about this, and and understandably so. It's the, it's a very good very good to know about this, but but. Can you see that it requires quite a lot of emotional development before you're going to feel it? So a lot of it's going to be just fascinating material and facts um, until you actually go through some, like quite a lot of change emotionally and quite a lot of reception of God's love will be required to understand, and, you know, really understand at soul level, go through the actual experience. All right, so, so what we'll do now is we'll have a break for a half an hour. It's, uh, if we come back at quarter past two, and we'll get started on the next subject that we want to discuss with you.